Good morning, First Baptist Church of China Grove. Uh, very blessed morning, Sunday morning. Hope you're tuning in and listening. We're very excited as we see the country reopening, uh, the disease cases numbers falling. Uh, this is a blessing. Hope that continues and that we in our country can get back to normal. And uh, of course, this means also that less people will be affected by that disease. We have uh, several people in our church who've either had surgeries or getting ready to. Uh, one is happening Monday, uh, Janet Brawley. And let's pray for those in our church who are sick. Maybe they're going through chemo therapy or something like that, or they're dealing with problems, financial, job wise. A lot of people with jobs, without jobs right now. Uh, thank God for the good jobs report last week. And let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessing and help at this time. Lord, look down upon us. Uh, Lord, I know we are sinful, but yet you have provided the blood of Jesus to cleanse us from all sin. Cleanse our hearts, Lord, that we might be used greatly of you. And Lord, we ask diligently, not for ourselves, but for those who are hurting, for those who are in need, for those who are suffering physically, at this time, or maybe they're suffering financially, or maybe they're, the stress has been too much in their lives over the last number of months. Pray, Lord, for all these things. Pray you will bless and continue to help and work in our nation. And Lord, especially as we deal with the racial tension in our nation, help us as Christians to shine the light, to show people that love is the answer and Violence never settles anything. As Jesus said, he who lives by the sword will die by the sword. And Lord, help us to realize that as you said, love our, even our enemies. Do good to them that despitefully use us. And Lord, uh, as we're reminded by the great minister Martin Luther King, that violence is never a solution, but, a, but just perpetuates the problem. Lord, we ask a blessing on our country, our church, our nation, our world that needs Jesus. Help us to be an instrument in that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> well, we're talking today about sound doctrine. Now, sound doctrine or our beliefs are important. I wonder how many of you have ever been to a store Maybe a, a tire store, been to the doctor, been to get your car worked on, or some other thing like that. And as you're talking to the person, you realize that the person you're talking to, either about your health or your car, really doesn't know anything about those items. And you become disturbed, you become upset, you become exasperated, tense, Stressful. It's a tedious situation, and you can't wait to get out of there and find somebody who really knows their business. Well, that's kind of like a Christian without sound doctrine. If we don't have sound doctrine, we don't know what we believe and why we believe it, then we're, our witness is going to kind of sound like that. Somebody at a tire store trying to help you with tires that doesn't know anything about tires. And so it's important that we as Christians know what we believe. That's so important. So, so important. And today I just want to share with you the basic premises of our faith. And the reason I'm sharing those, if you don't know those, you don't need to start studying prophecy and find out about the rapture and all that. You, you don't need to be bothered with that. You need to work on the basics. You got to get the basics down first. And we're going to talk about that today. What are the basic beliefs of our faith? And I would be, I would be interested if we could poll everyone in the church and say, what are five, six, seven basic beliefs of the Christian faith? And just see what we came up with. We might be shocked, I'm afraid. But here we are as Christians, and let's remind ourselves that God tells us, and this is kind of graduates too, uh, remember today, 
that uh, graduates, you need to study to show yourself approved. First Timothy 2.15, God says, study to show yourself approved unto God. Rightly dividing the word of truth. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We're to study in such a way that we're not ashamed, either before God or in our witness. And we need to understand that we can share with others uh, about our faith. Jesus was talking to the hip, the hypocrites and the Pharisees, and he told them to study in the Word. For in them, in the Word, you'll find the words of eternal life. Uh, so Jesus even pointed people to the Scriptures. Now, John Hick, an atheist, wrote that Christianity. Now, this is an atheist is the only faith or religion that claims to be founded by God. He went on to say that if, that's, if the Christianity is true, then it's the only way. Because it's the only one that claims that God founded it. Do you ever think about that? You know, Buddhists founded Buddhism... Uh, all the other religions were founded Muhammad, founded Muhammadism, but only one faith says God Himself created it, and we have it. Now, have you ever thought Christian beliefs are important? Well, all you know, we could say, well, everything in the Bible is important. Every belief is important. Well, some not so much as others. And I want to use an illustration about that. Um, a guy, if you have a car, and I said to you, can you drive your car without a door? You'd probably say yes. Matter of fact, I had a son who had a Jeep and took the doors off and drove it for years. Uh, and I drove in it, I rode in it one time, only once, and never again. Uh, the entire time I felt like I was going to fall out of the, even with a seatbelt on. Yes, you can drive a car without doors. Can you drive a car without a spare tire? Yes, not a good idea. You could drive a car without a spare tire. Can you drive a car without a muffler? Yes, you can drive a car without a muffler. Again, not a good idea. Uh, going to make a lot of people mad at you. It's going to be very noisy. But you could drive a car without a muffler, without a radio. There are a lot of things on a car that are needful, but not essential. Okay? Understand that. Things you can't drive a car, you, you've got to have a motor, you've got to have a transmission, you've got to have a place to sit in that car, you've got to have a steering wheel, you've got to have an accelerator and a brake. So see, see, there are certain things on the car, if you take them away, it becomes impossible to drive the car. And there are certain things in Christianity that you cannot leave out and have the car run. In other words, if you leave that out, it's, essent it's essential. It's so important and major that the car, the Christian faith, ceases to be the Christian faith. And many have done that today. There are many churches today that preach that Jesus is not divine. And I say to those churches, they have ceased to become Christian. I would not call a church a Christian church that preaches that Jesus is not the virgin-born Son of God. Because they believe that Jesus is less than divine, less than who He said He was. So that's just to show you one idea. The other way to look at it, if you have a tent held up by tent poles, all, you know, those poles are essential. And if you take one out, the whole tent falls. So an essential tent pole to hold it up. So there are you know, certain things that have to be there in place. And there are certain things about our belief system that we have to be aware of. Let's look uh, as we begin in Titus chapter 1, verse 16. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him. And this is talking about people who say, I'm a Christian, but deny the beliefs, being an abominable and disobedient and every good work reprobate. In chapter 2, the thought is carried on, and this explains, it's about their belief system. But speak thou the things that become sound doctrine. 
He is speaking about a group of people here who are professing Christ, yet their doctrine indicates they are not. And we are to speak the things which are sound, true doctrine. That's important. Now look in 2 Timothy 3.16. The first and essential things we have to understand is the Bible is the Word of God. Before that I want to say this. There are essential beliefs, the important beliefs, and minor beliefs about the Bible. Uh, I can, for example, we, we talk about the second coming, the rapture, and things like that. Whether I believe in the rapture or not, I can still be a Christian. Uh, you know, you don't even have to, and I, I'm a hazard to say this, but you don't even have to believe in a hell to go to heaven. And that's, that's strange, to, it sounds strange, but it's true. Because that's not an essential part of salvation. Although I can tell you there is a hell. And the Bible speaks clearly about it. And, and some people illogically remove parts of the Bible or part of the beliefs. But it, again, you're taking the doors off the car. It's not an essential. It's not essential to going to heaven. It's not essential to being Christian. But we, we believe in that. And uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, and I, oh, by the way, and I have this saying, in major things, we must have unity. In minor things, liberty, but in all things, charity or love. In all things, love. But is the Bible true or not? 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture, here's the claim, is given by what means? By inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine. That means teaching, for reproving, correcting your life, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Yes, the, the Bible is the Word of God. Let me tell you something. There were and are in existence 5,000 source manuscripts, pieces of the Bible from the first century. Now, liberal theologians in the 1800s and the early 1900s believed the scriptures had changed. Do you hear me? You ever heard of that historic Jesus they talk about on TV? Well, the legend changed through the years. Wait a minute. We have first century documents. And those documents look just like the Bible we have today. That means the narrative of who Jesus was did not change. Through the years, most of the scripture was written in the first century by 60 AD. I think Revelation might be out there a little later, but by 60 AD, most of the New Testament was done. And we're talking about 30 years after the death of Jesus. So if we have 5,000 source documents early on, that's pretty good. Then something else happened. In 1946 through 54, they began in the Qumran area between Israel and Egypt in the caves to find manuscripts. They were ancient manuscripts, oldest, the oldest writings of the New Old Testament, the Old Testament now. And by the way, these documents preceded Jesus, the time of Jesus. And guess what? The fragments they found correlated exactly with what we have right here in our modern Bible. So you have the Old Testament verified, you have the New Testament verified, and they have not changed. So this idea that through the years the legend of Jesus was just embellished and became a more of a legend like Wyatt Earp or something, or Davy Crockett, is nothing but hogwash. It is a lie. It is not true. Because the earliest documents, the most accurate documents, say he was divine. He did do these miracles. It's only the guys who came along in the 1800s, almost two centuries later, who began to say, no, Jesus didn't do those things. Well, 1800 years out. That's a little far-fetched to start judging something that happened 1,800 years ago. But let me tell you something. The text is no different from the modern Bible. God says in Psalm 12, 
verses 6 and 7, the words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, it says, God shall keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. God's word will be preserved. He says in the New Testament, Jesus said this, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words will not pass away. Do you hear me? The whole universe can be rolled up and destroyed and exploded. But Jesus said, it may pass away, but my words will not pass away. Wow. I tell you, is the Bible the Word of God? And I want to tell you, historically, spiritually, and in every way, absolutely no question. The Word of God is Scripture. The Word of God, God breathed, Theonustos, that's exactly what it is. You can rest assured upon the promises of God in this book. And anybody that's read it as long as I have, and from cover to cover many times, and investigated and studied and studied the words and studied the text and studied the history behind it. Matter of fact, that's my doctoral degree is in that area, uh, that subject area of the exposition of the Bible and the putting together of the Bible. I could tell you authoritatively, this is the Word of God. There is no question in my mind. Zero. And if you don't believe it, you just haven't read it enough. If you read it enough, you'll feel like I do. It is the Word of God. And that's the first thing we need to remember. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Right there in Timothy. Hope you wrote that verse down. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. The next thing, God. We have to believe there is a God. The true that our God in the Bible is the true and living God. Now, many people might agree with this one, but not agree about Jesus. But if God does not exist, what's the alternative explanation for existence? There is no hope in answering the question how we got here, how the universe got here, how the earth got here, how the solar system got here without God. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the third thing in our beliefs. Jesus was divine. He was virgin born. He died for sins and he was resurrected. Now, I don't have time to speak on every aspect of that this morning. I will just say this. By the very virtue of the scriptures in Matthew 1 and Luke 1, we know he was virgin born. Mary declared, I have, uh, how can I be pregnant? I've not been with a man. She knew that she was a virgin, she was a virgin, and that the child within her had no explanation other than God's miracle. He was born supernaturally. It says in John 1, in the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And then it says in verse 14, and the Word was made flesh. Now what was the Word? The Word was God. And it was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory. Talking about Jesus. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He was the representation of the Father. What John is saying, and it's born in other scripture, that in many other scriptures, we're not going to give you all a hundred of them today, he was God incarnate. God in the flesh. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was made known in the flesh. He died on the cross, rose from the dead, because what? He's God. He can't be held by death. Both of these events are recorded historically and biblically in the very Bible we just said was accurate. And, but without his virgin birth, listen, there are people who say, oh, Jesus wasn't virgin born. That's part of that legend. Hey, then what do you have if you, you have a non-virgin born, born Jesus? You have a, a, a child born with a sin nature. And with a sin nature, how could he have died for our sins? For he had his own sins. Nor would he be divine, nor would the source of his miracles be from his power and his divine power. 
So the whole thing collapses like a house of cards. If you don't believe Jesus is who he said, who the Bible says he is, virgin born, son of God, deity in the flesh, and he died for then he did, he couldn't have died for our sins. And he would the resurrection then becomes meaningless also. So and of course that's what that's what a lot of liberal theologians want you to think. But let's look at 1 Timothy 3.16 and see what it has to say. And here it is. Without controversy, in other words, there is no argument here. We can't, we're not going to discuss it. We're not going to argue it. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness or the truth. God was manifest in the flesh. Let me say that again. God was manifest in the flesh. Jesus was divinely, absolutely God. He was justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached it to the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. That's Jesus. And folks, there is no question of the declaration of Paul. There is no question of the declaration of John, there's no question, listen to me, of the declaration of the Pharisees who did not believe in him, who said, by the things he said, he makes himself God. Because he said he was the son of God, and he had the ability to forgive sins. They said, only God can claim these things. So the very people who were against him said that he is claiming to be God. John nailed it. Paul nailed it and all through the Bible. It's clear. So, now that we understand about the Bible, we understand about Jesus, what would be the next big thing? Salvation. Now we have a virgin born Savior declared by the Word of God and we have the gospel of salvation. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says we're saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves. It's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. So our salvation is not dependent upon what we do. It is dependent upon what Jesus did. And what did he do? John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting eternal life. And everybody says, why do you say everlasting eternal? Because the word there is eternal life. God loved the world. When he gave his son, what did his son do? His son died for our sins. It's faith through grace. It's the finished work of Jesus Christ. Nothing can be added to it. He died for our sins. He rose again from the dead. He bought our salvation. He paid our way to heaven. Over 150 New Testament verses tell us that salvation is trust, believing, or faith. And in that process, if we trust him, he gives us a new birth. Amen? Amen. Well, what's the next great belief? Acts 1.11, the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but I strongly believe that Jesus is coming I kind of believe he'll come in my lifetime. I'm not going to be held to take the task over that. I feel the time is short. I don't know the time is short. No man knows. But the second coming. The Bible speaks literally hundreds of times about his second coming. Most people don't know this, but the Bible speaks more of Jesus' second coming than his first Well, we know Jesus came the first time. So if in the Old, I'm talking about Old and New Testament, speak more about his second coming than his first. Well, that's interesting. That's got to be a fundamental of the faith. Matter of fact, Acts 1.11, the same Jesus, we we shall so come in like manner. Now, that's the scriptures the Bible speaks about. Of his first coming. Second Peter, let's look there in Second Peter, if we could. 
Uh, let's just quote it up there. Uh, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as, continue as they were from the beginning of creation. What the scriptures are saying here, there will come people, apostate believers, in other words, false believers, who will come in the last days and say, where's Jesus? He was coming, but he hasn't come. We don't believe he's coming. So they will deny the second coming. There are some already probably out there denying the second coming of Jesus. And yet it is a fundamental belief. Well, I have laid out here fundamental beliefs that we have to know and we need to know so that when the time comes, we can stand. You know, Peter said that sanctify the Lord God in your heart. And be ready always to give an answer. Let me ask you today, can you give an answer? Can you answer the unbeliever? If they say, what do you Christians believe? Can you say, I believe one, two, I believe the Bible's the word of God. I believe Jesus was virgin born because he had to be virgin born to be our savior. That he was God incarnate. That uh, I believe that Jesus died for my sins and rose again from the dead. I believe Jesus is coming again. Can you relate those beliefs and share those with people? If they asked you, what do Christians believe? And I would focus on Jesus because that's the thing that's going to touch people's hearts. But he says, be ready always to give an answer to everyone that asks you for the reason of the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. Folks, we all need to prepare our hearts. We need to be in the book. Studying, be prepared to give that answer. And that's important. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of, of God. Listen, let me ask you something. Are you ready to defend your faith? Well, let me just say this going forward. I want you to look at our country and ask me, or not ask me, ask yourself if you think you're going to need to defend your faith. And my answer to you is absolutely. I think the time is coming when we as Christians are going to have to be able, and it's going to be necessary to, say, to tell people what we believe. It's not the first time, believe it or not. There was a, a Baptist minister named Smith in New England who was arrested and put in jail for preaching the gospel early in our country's history. And another minister came to see him. His name was John Smith, uh, the guy in jail. And he said, John, what are you doing in prison? He said, what are you doing out of prison? And I think the time is coming where our faith in Jesus Christ is going to be tested. And I'm warning you in a way and you're saying, well, pastor, what happened to all those good sermons, encouraging sermons? Well, we're getting over the disease now. It's time, time to get back to business. Uh, tough business. And some of this is, and sometimes we can't always preach stuff that's encouraging. Sometimes it has to be challenging. Sometimes, and I know that I did that last week. I, I've been I'm kind of rough on you a couple weeks here. You know, losing your life, and then this week challenging you, saying you need to, to be doing this. And you do need to be doing it. Look in Jude, and let's look in chapter 1, and I always tell people, if you have Jude chapter 1 and chapter 2, there's something wrong with your Bible, because there's only one chapter of Jude. Of Jude. And Jude says this, and it's very interesting. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. In other words, he said, I sat down to write an epistle about salvation. And God the Holy Spirit intervened. And he says this, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you, encourage you, that you should earnestly, very vehemently, contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. Wow. Continue to, the fa to for certain men, verse 4, crept in unaware, 
This is what's happened to the church today who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of, our, of God into lasciviousness, denying the only Lord God, see, denying his nature, and, den and our Lord Jesus Christ. That's exactly what has happened. I will therefore put you in remembrance that though you once knew this, how the Lord having saved the people out of the land of Egypt afterward destroy them that believe not. Listen, we're in that day. We're in that day where we need to contend for the faith. We need to be willing to contend for the faith. Stand for Jesus. And, and that includes standing for what's right. If something is right, it's right. Uh, I've taken a lot of flack lately over some things, but I told somebody, I will stand for right if, if no matter what. If it costs me friends, if it costs me whatever, we have to be willing to pay that price. I would rather be right and be with Jesus than be your friend. Now, I love you. But folks, if it comes to the point of you saying, well, you're going to have to compromise what's right. I'm sorry, I can't do that. I, you know, we have to contend for the faith. We have to be willing to, somebody has to stand up. Somebody has to stand up and say what is right. But sanctify the Lord God in your heart. Be ready always to give an answer for the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And the other thing is spiritually prepare yourself. Ephesians 6, put on the armor of God. Pray, pray, pray some more. Be prayerful. Walk in prayer. Walk in your faith and pray to God for strength. And then, lastly, have the courage. I'm here to tell you, the Christian faith is built on courage. People walked into the lion's den singing hymns. Our forefathers, our Baptist forefathers in Germany were persecuted. Baptists in England were persecuted. Baptists in America early on were persecuted. That's all right. We come from a very persecuted lot. But our people have always, always stood for the faith that was once delivered to, to the saints. Know your Bible, know what you believe, and know the faith. Let's pray together today. Lord, I, as I pray this morning, I give thanks for those who are studying to show themselves approved unto God. I pray we all will. I pray we'll all take a stand for what's right. That we'll do what is necessary to show where we stand. And Lord, I pray for our country again. It seems to be in disarray, divided. And yet, Lord, love is needed and understanding. And let there be that. And I pray, Lord, if there's someone in the sound of my voice that does not know Christ as their personal Savior, that they would turn to him in faith, believing that Christ was all the things I've mentioned, and that he died for their sins, and that trusting him to pay for their sins is enough for salvation. If they'll trust and believe in him and ask Jesus to save them, he will. And he'll come into their life and heart and give them a new birth. Lord, we thank you today in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, congregation.